devotion and so the men who were there they understand what I'm talking about but uh, Danny did a very good job this morning in leading and sharing that devotion and uh, so a lot of good things happening and a great start to the day we'll just continue in that same vein um, in terms of announcements you'll see them in your bulletin but just a couple things to point out there are goodie bags in the front foyer vestibule um, for the college students so uh, remember to pick those up on your way out today if you're here. Um, these were prepared by the United Methodist Women, and they're right there on the table just before you exit out the door. Um, church cleanup day scheduled for next Saturday, 9 o'clock. Uh, a lot of projects, um, a lot of things to do on the list. Uh, Freddie shared those this morning with the group, so there's a lot to do. And just be mindful that is a rain or shine event. So plan on being here, uh, a lot of work to do. And as Freddie said this morning, the more people, the less time that it takes. So anyway, plan to be here next Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Um, Tuesday, Janelle said there's a finance committee meeting at six o'clock, that will be here at the church. Also on Tuesday, sponsored by Cora, there's a mobile market, um, it's a food truck. That's going to be here at the church from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. So spread the word on that. Um, Tim has provided that on Facebook and other um, other means. But please share that for those that are in need of food. So uh, that will be on Tuesday, again, from 10 a.m. until 12 noon. And speaking of feeding the hungry, um, we're collecting canned goods for the I'm gonna call it the food pantry. I'm not sure if that's actually the right name, but it's under the shelter, under the picnic shelter out there. And thanks to Ricky Ziblay, he's built a real nice display cabinet with a glass door. Um, so a lot of foods are now in there that's available for those who need it. So that's complimentary of what's taking place on Tuesday with the Cora Mobile Market. So anyway, other announcements are found in your bulletin. So just make note of those that, um, those announcements and opportunities that are listed there. Any other <coughs> announcements? Right. If not, we'll continue with our time of worship. And again, thank you for being here. And I read somewhere this week, I'll try to get this right, just something to think about. As we're going through a challenging season, as we continue to go through that since early last year, um, the saying was, don't wait for the storm to end. Learn to dance in the rain. So give that some thought. Thank you. 
morning, church. Good morning. I want to give a shout out to Howard Willett if he's joining us online this morning. I want him to know that this Duke boy is paying his penance this morning, wearing his Carolina blue mask in case you can't see that from where the camera, Howard. I just want you to know that I'm wearing it for you. Will you all please stand and join me in our greeting? Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. Amen. Let us remain standing and singing. I know last week I made you sing seven verses. I, don't tell me I never did anything for you. This week we're going to sing six verses. <laughs> One through five and verse seven of O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
Amen. Thank you, choir. At this time, I invite those who would like to take their children to the nursery. You can follow our nursery workers down at this time. And as they take the children to the nursery and return, we will be singing our hymn of preparation. There is a balm in Gilead, hymn number 375. Anna, the daughter of Phineal, 
of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with feasting, fasting, and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Sherry. Will you all pray with me? Almighty God, we come before you today to hear what it is that you have to say. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill this space. Sit down beside us. Stir among us. Make us anew. So that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts shall be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Through this sermon series, we have been reminded how we, as the people of God, are a call and response kind of people. In our liturgy, in our prayers, in our daily lives, we have a call and response relationship with God. God calls out to us and we respond. We call out to God and God responds. We've heard stories of how God called out to Samuel and Samuel responded by becoming a priest. We heard about God calling out to Jonah and the Ninevites to be a prophet and to repentance. And they each responded in their own ways leading to mercy from God. Last week we heard about an unclean spirit who called out to Jesus in the middle of the synagogue and Jesus responded by rebuking him and sending him out of the man that he was living in. We have been reminded to be prepared for where God might be calling out to us with his presence. To be prepared for where God might be calling us to go. To be prepared for what God might be calling us to do. And today we end this series with a story about ritual. A story about a calling to obedience, a calling to patience, a calling that has no due date attached to it. Our scripture opens with Mary and Jesus getting released from quarantine, if that doesn't sound familiar to many of us in our lives today. Under Jewish law in Leviticus 12, it states that after a woman gives birth to a son, she is considered, her and the baby are considered unclean for 33 days. They are not allowed to touch anything holy. They are not allowed to go to the temple until after those 33 days are up. So for those 33 days since that first Christmas night, Mary has not spoken to, seen anybody. Maybe not even her husband, Joseph. Mary and Jesus are out of their quarantine and the family enters the temple to be obedient to the religious law. Something that's always of note in the gospel stories is how Jesus and his parents, Jesus and the disciples, or just Jesus himself, follow the law that is written. Jesus was not born above the law. He was born to fulfill the law. So Jesus and Mary continued to remain obedient to what all mothers and children went through at this time. And so they traveled some 60 miles south from Nazareth to Jerusalem to go through this ritual cleansing and offering of sacrifices. But little did they know that they were not the only ones who were living into a calling of obedience in the temple that day. Simeon was a righteous and devout man of faith. Our scripture tells us that he is a man who is waiting patiently on the consolation of Israel, on the healing of Israel. He had lived long enough to see the land that he called home mistreated and overrun by foreign empires. He had seen the Roman government assert its dominance on this land that was once considered holy to his people. We hear that the Spirit of God rested upon him 
So not only did his fellow members of his community see him as somebody devout and faithful, but God also looked on Simeon with grace and love. The Spirit had called out to Simeon and said, You shall not see death until you have seen the Lord's Messiah face to face. So Simeon went to the temple week after week, month after month, year after year, searching earnestly for the Lord's Messiah. But for who knows how long Simeon left the temple, having not seen what he went in search of. Studies show that one of the reasons why people choose to leave church is because of some sort of disappointment they have in God. People who are faithful and devout believers grow tired and weary of doing the same things over and over, week after week, and seeing no change in their lives. What they feel is inaction from God. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result each time that you do it. And that's the thing that people use as an argument against coming to church or being a part of a worshiping community. They say, I went to church every week. We stood up, we sat down. We sang seven verses because the pastor is insane. We prayed, we listened, we ate, and we left only to come back again the next week and nothing having changed in our lives. We kept doing the same things. We kept saying the same words. We kept praying the same prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And he never came. And ultimately, the people grow tired and weary of this disappointment that they continue to feel. And so they leave. I heard a story one time about a man whose church was earnestly preparing for Y2K. Many of you might remember this time. Some of you might not have even been born yet. But when people were, this was the time from 1999 into 2000 when people thought that the world was going to implode because the computers were going to go back to zero when it turned to the new year. That the economies of the world were going to crash. The Lord, some people even believed that the Lord was going to come back at the beginning of this new millennium and take those true believers with them. And this guy's church was one of those places. And so his church was earnestly preparing for Y2K. They held a worship service on New Year's Eve at 11 p.m. so that they were in worship when God was going to come and take his believers with them. And so at 11.55, after singing many songs, hearing lots of prayers, reading lots of scripture, the pastor invited the congregation to come to the altar and there were many shouts of hallelujah, many tears being wept, this man said. And as time continued to go on, he realized that they had been there for a really long time at the altar. And he looked down at his watch and he realized that it was 1215. And they were still in the sanctuary. <laughs> that the Lord had not taken them into heaven as they thought that the Lord was going to do. And he said he walked out of the church that night and he never went back because of, the, the, because of the disappointment that he felt God had placed upon them. Disappointment is something that runs rampant in our culture. Our social media, Amazon Prime, direct messaging type of world that we live in has made us grow accustomed to instant gratification. Our work from home digital world has cut down the amount of time that we have to wait for change to happen. If we see a problem in a report for work, we can contact the people that we need to really quickly to get that problem solved before the report is due. We need something fixed at the house. We know who we can call to get the problem fixed quickly. We know that if we're trying to find directions to somewhere, our phones are programmed to find the quickest route. There is not much thinking that has to go along in this world much anymore. Our world has become so automated that when things do not 
happen as quickly as we want them to, as Danny was reminding the men this morning, when things do not happen as quickly as we want them to, when change isn't seen as quickly as we want it to, our patience runs thin. Our world has become so automated that when things or people or even God do not respond in the manner or the timeline that we wish that that change would happen, our attitudes shift. Disappointment takes the place of joy. Doubt takes the place of faith. Fear takes the place of love. I can only imagine the feelings that Simeon felt each week. That he would go to the temple earnestly seeking for the Messiah that the Lord said was going to be there one day. And then he wasn't. Week after week after week, showing up eager, not sure of what exactly he was looking for, but trusting in the Lord that he would push him in the direction that he needed to go. You can almost hear the snide comments in the jeers of onlookers who would say, why are you continuing to do this, Simeon? Why put yourself through the disappointment? Why put yourself through the suffering? But what the others don't know is that Simeon had placed his hope in a God who worked at a different timeline than man worked at. And when he finally sees Jesus face to face on this day in our scripture that we heard, we hear his shouts of joy and words of praise and affirmation over this child. For my eyes have seen your salvation. He cries out to God, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Simeon wasn't alone, though, in his praise this day in the temple. For there was also a prophet who had been waiting patiently. Anna was a woman of, who had married at a young age with so much life and promise ahead of her. But after seven years of marriage, her husband died and leaving her a widow for decades. She too, like Simeon, found purpose going to the temple, praising the Lord, waiting earnestly, preparing herself physically, mentally, spiritually for meeting the Lord one day. We hear in our passage that she is 84 years of age and comes to the temple regularly to fast and pray night and day. And when she too sees the Lord, she lets loose shouts of praise and she tells everyone who will listen what she has seen. This calling to obedience, this calling to patient faith, this calling to wait on the Lord is difficult and painful work. But it is a joyous work on the other end of it. It truly is the work of those who know that their hope is placed in something that works at a different pace than the world moves. It is the work of ministers of the word of God. The church that I grew up in had staff, paid staff people who ran all of the programming and administration. We had custodial staff, a Duke intern, an associate, and a senior pastor. Many, many members of paid church staff. And on the back of the bulletin, every single Sunday, there was a list of who those paid staff people were. It had their name and their title beside each other. And at the very bottom of that list, every single week, it said, Ministers, Congregation. The names above always changed. Staff members came and went Positions were made, positions were taken away, but that bottom line always remained. Congregation ministers. The congregation remained the ministers of the word of God. The congregation stuck it out through the good and the bad. The congregation continued to be the hands and feet of of God, no matter what the world around them said, the congregation remained obedient and patient, 
even when the Lord gave them a calling that didn't have a due date attached to it. Simeon and Anna had faith that the Lord was going to come and be among them again. Simeon and Anna knew the words of the prophets of old who told stories of God's abiding presence in the history of Israel. They had their own personal experiences from their long life to lean on of where God had showed up and caused change in their life. And it was that bedrock of scripture, tradition, experience, and reason that they stood upon that let them have faith. In the midst of the naysayers and the jeers of the onlookers. And they remained faithful when the world gave them no reason to. They remained faithful when the world gave them no reason to. Because friends, the church and our acts of worship are a sign of resistance to this world. Our worship is a sign of resistance to this world. We show up in whatever ways we can for God and for one another, even when the world tells us that there is no reason to. We sing in harmony when the world tells us that we can't get along. We pray for healing even when the world says miracles aren't real. We stand and confess our faith in a God who is daily making us into the people that we were created to be, even when the world around us is trying to tear us down everywhere that we turn. We remain obedient and patient in God because God remains obedient and patient to us. Because that is the work of that we are called to do. That is the work that we are called to be about. To be a light to the world. To be a beacon of hope. To be a sign of resistance in a world that says it is all for naught. Oscar Romero was a Catholic priest in the country of El Salvador in the 1970s. A country that was wrought at that time with dissension and political upheaval. Father Romero preached many homilies on this idea of remaining patient and obedient to a God who was moving and doing things in a world that human eyes could not see or understand. Each week in his homilies, Father Romero would list off the names of those who had been killed by the government that week in his community. Until ultimately his name joined that list as he was killed by a political extremist while he was presiding at the communion table. And I'm going to end this morning's sermon with a prayer that is attributed to Father Romero that I saw this week that I felt was a great end cap to this sermon series. That as we are called to step out in faith, responding to these calls that God has placed on our life, knowing that this call to patience, this call to waiting, is painful and hard but necessary in this world that we live in. Father Romero prays these words. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. We are ministers, 
not messiahs. We are prophets of a future that is not our own. So church, may we have faith. May we have patience. May we respond when the Lord calls out our name. May it be so. Amen. 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 At this time, having heard the word of the Lord read and proclaimed, I invite you to stand as you are able at this time. As we recite our historic affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, which is found on page 881 in your hymnals, in your bulletins, or on the screens. Church, I ask you, what do you believe? now into a time of prayer. Let us continue to be in prayer for our nation and our world and all of her leaders. We want to continue to lift up all of our health care workers who have been working so tirelessly and sacrificially for us throughout this past year. Continue to keep them in our prayers. We want to pray for all of those affected by COVID-19, those that we know, those that we may not know in our communities who have been impacted. We give thanks for those who are healing, but we continue to pray for those who are suffering from it. Don Zibley asked for prayers for Rebecca Marsh as she continues her battle. There are many others that I know that are heavy on our hearts this day that we have within ourselves and those that we would like to share with the community. Just a reminder to continue to send those in to me or to Beth and we'll be sure to send those out during the week. If you know somebody who would need a prayer shawl, be sure that you grab one of these after the service so that you can take it to them this week. Let us go to God in prayer at this time. Almighty God, we come to you today with hearts that are waiting. Hearts that are waiting for you to come and be among us. Lord, give us the strength to be your hands and feet, even when we do not know when the due date will come. Give us the strength to persevere in the face of the naysayers. To continue to be a sign of resistance to this world that says what we're doing is crazy. Lord, help us to reach out in love, to reach out in grace to those who do not know better. Let us be your light in a world full of darkness. Lord, we know that there are many in our lives today who are hurting, and in this moment of silence, we lift their names to you. Lord, we know that there are many names on our hearts that you hear with your ears that before we can even say them aloud. Lord, we pray that you draw near to those people. Remind them that they are not alone. Help us to be your hands and feet in whatever ways we can for them this week. Lord, we pray all of this to you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, Christ you are forgiven. Glory is God. Amen. Amen. I pray that the peace of Christ go with you, not only this day, but forevermore. Amen. At this time, as we prepare to bless these elements and partake of communion together, just a reminder that we're going to do it the same way we've been doing it the past few months, which means that you'll come forward at the... The usher will lead your family forward, and you guys can, I will give out the wafer, and then you can grab a cup on your side of the aisle, and you can return to your seats via the outside aisle. If you would like to kneel at the altar, then it will be open for you if you would like to do so. Once again, this is not my table. This is not the church's table. This is the Lord's table. So any and all are welcome to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. At this time, I invite you to stand as you are able as we prepare to bless these elements together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, our Alpha and our Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and Holy Spirit, you are forever one God. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And in you, we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not desert us. You made covenant with your people Israel and spoke through your prophets and teachers. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who called you Abba, Father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace the people as your own and filled them with a longing for a peace that would last and for justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you. He turned and he shared it with his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took a cup. He gave thanks to you. He turned and he shared it with his disciples and he said, take, Drink, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I invite you to extend your hands in front of you as we call on the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. As the grain and grapes once dispersed in the fields are now united on this table and bread and juice so may we and all your people be gathered from every time and place into the unity of your eternal household and feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus is always teaching us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. The bread which we share, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? The cup over which we give thanks, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Will those who are assisting please come forward? Friends, the table is ready. Come and receive what you are, and go and be what you receive.
Will you all please join me in the prayer after communion that you can find on the screens? <clears throat> Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I give thanks that the choir sang this song last week as a kind of a precursor to us singing this. I was holding this song off for this last Sunday of the sermon series. Um, a song that is known by many of us, loved by many of us. Um, a song that really uh, resembles this call and response theme that we have been on this past month. So I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our hymn of response. Here I am, Lord, hymn number 593.
Church, I thank you for coming this morning, either tuning in online or being here in person. I give thanks for you being here. Next week, I will be out of town. Dale will be preaching next Sunday, so come and support him as he brings the sermon. Church, hear this benediction, that God loves you, and there ain't nothing that you can do about it, except to let that love live inside of you, and to go out into this community, go out into this world, and share that love with everyone that you meet. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go now in peace. Amen. Amen.